All right, so we've got time um, for a few questions uh, for our panelists, so please, we encourage the audience to uh, step up. Uh, yes, thanks very much for this very informative and, and very scientifically up-to-date um, uh, presentation. I wanted to direct my question to Rick Hills because I saw that you had on your list for West Africa, Bamaleke from the Cameroon. And in fact, uh, we've been saying that in fact, the Cameroon did not provide slaves to North Amer enslaved Africans. So we have to see the Bamaleke Cameroon as a sort of stand in for now for the Angolan population. Because that's where, so I just wanted to find out that's if a, that, that's the a good database has been updated or if this, because a lot of people come to tell me, well, I'm from the Cameroon and I said, you can't be, have ancestry when there were no slaves at the time between, you know, uh, 1619 and 1860. The Cameroon was not that feeder mm -hmm. for the, now some of them could be Igbos because we know that Cameroon, but you have to take into account that some of those, the, the, that Bantu population passed through certain genetic kind of a transmission right, right, as they right, made right. the way down right. both the Eastern right. Bantu and the Western. So I just wanted to so, make so, sure so, that right. more, that more, okay. no, I have to say that, okay. that we do the, 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 the research and collect data for Angola. Right, That's no, no you, you're absolutely right. I, I liked exactly what you said just now. We have to do the research. So based on what you guys have been saying, in terms of the historical uh, uh, research, the historical uh, evidence that uh, Cameroon, um, present day Cameroon region, right, did not uh, contribute to uh, any of the uh, uh, enslaved Africans that were traded. Now that, that is still up, I mean, that's not, a, that's not a definitive. There are folks who do not believe that. And in particular, if you look on the coast, I just came from Cameroon last uh, December, and I went to a fort along the coast uh, of, 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 uh, of Cameroon and, and where enslaved Africans were housed, where there was the point of no return. So there are, you know, historical revenants. I mean, Well, we know also that, let's say they went to the Caribbean, that there was an enormous amount of, of, of selling and buying of enslaved Africans in the Caribbean to the Americas too. So they may not have directly come here, but they've come, they could have come here via the Caribbean. But it doesn't matter. Let's say you're right, okay? We see Cameroon as a transitional area anyway, because it's, we call it the, the, the I mean, it, it's been called the Bight of Biafra. And, uh, you look at the genetics of the Igbo communities and the, uh, some of the Cameroon groups like the Vamiliki, it's very, they're very, very similar. That's, that, that border is a border that was given to them you know, by, by European, you know, was it after World War I or II? You know, all of those boundaries were set up. That, that area consisted of families that actually were split after that boundary um, was set up. And then, of course, the, the Biafra War, they was back and forth, the boundary went this way, that way. But the, the bottom line is that's a transition area. So I see it as a transition of what we see in Nigeria and a transition, a good point, of Gabon and Angola, okay? So when we do our matches, we say where the match is to a present day country. That doesn't mean that that was uh, the, the, a present um, uh, day position where, or, or uh, a state where uh, enslaved Africans came from, um, where, where their ancestor came from during slavery. Do you see what I'm saying? We're, we're matching to a present day population. Great, thanks Rick. Next, next question. Hello. This question is for Dr. Mountain. Um, I was wondering if you could share a little information about your Roots in the Future initiative that was launched in 2011. If you could share a little bit about the successes as well as the challenges that 23andMe has faced. Yes, yeah, so, is this on? Um, okay, so in 2011, 23andMe launched a program called Roots into the Future and the reason for launching that program was because we were conducting research into the links between um, disease risk and um, genetics um, uh, by in, um, inviting our customers to uh, take surveys about their health and disease status. So what was happening though is it turns out that all of the studies we were doing were relevant only to people with Northern European ancestry because those most of our customers have ancestry tracing primarily to Northern Europe. And 
So it was very frustrating for us to see that we were, you know, just like the rest of the research genetics community, were kind of being restricted to, you know, just really a, a subset of the world in, in terms of our research, our um, genome-wide association studies. So we decided to launch this project to um, uh, enroll 10,000 African Americans um, into the 23andMe service and invite them to take part in research. So that project has been incredibly successful. Um, as I think I put the number up, we have um, um, well over 10,000 African Americans have, have signed up and joined 23andMe, and we have begun conducting the research um, to look at connections between health and genetics within uh, that particular group. It's a, obviously a very heterogeneous group. Um, and we're also exploring, um, you know, other aspects of the, the customer base uh, through surveys and, and analysis of the genetic data, by if, including looking at ancestry, uh, as I, I started to show here. So, so the project has been very successful, very high uh, survey response rate among the group, and uh, so engagement in the project, and we've been um, looking to start writing up some of the research results um, focused on, on the disease research. I think. So. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, Charles? Yeah. I, uh, again, this is a question to all members of the panel and also to the uh, audience. I, I just wonder, morally, is it uh, right for us to be charging African Americans to trace their ancestry using this kind of information, giving, using uh, uh, Rick's uh, a word that they were kidnapped and forcefully removed from the environment that they actually has uh, a link to? So why are we now charging for them to be able to trace that information back? Should there be a fund set aside that any African American who wants to use this kind of information should be able to tap into that funds and to derive this kind of information? Yeah, I agree with you, uh, Charles. There should be a fund, and you should be the first to contribute. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's really, to me, it looks like a double jeopardy in a sense. <laughs> no, no, what you, what, what you raised is a, is, a, is a really valid point. I mean, and it's been part of the discussion since, you know, we, we started doing this. And so, you know, the issue is should African Americans who are descendants of enslaved Africans uh, have to pay for what was taken from them? Yeah, and, you know, this is, uh, um, I mean, the prices have come way, way down, and in fact, the, the, the initiative you were talking about was pro bono, right? That's right, right. Joanna? That particular um, Yes, those 10,000 tests was, were, 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 yeah, were free not, yes. to, to people who enrolled early That's enough. That's right. Okay, next. My question is really for the panel. It just seems like such a wonderful opportunity to have representatives here from different organizations that are conducting these ancestry tests. And I think one of the challenges we heard from Dr. Tishkoff this morning, and it continues to be a problem, is obviously how to get accurate test results. And I wonder, to what extent do you think it's a responsibility or desirable aim for your companies to have um, similar test results for people? And are there steps that you're taking to get consistency among organisations? And if so, how can you fit this with your commercial objectives? Well, uh, for if I, can I say something? Go ahead. <laughs> you, you shouldn't expect that you get the same results from different companies. I mean, the, the, the reference databases are different. Um, what the companies can do, though, is work together to some extent to come up with a, a set of standards that you could expect consistency on. Um, but, you know, certain tests for, you know, certain companies have unique tests, and that's what makes the, the company unique. Um, uh, but I do think that there's room for uh, the companies to work together to come up with a set of standards. Okay, so we're over time, but uh, Dr. Blakey, just uh, 20 yeah. seconds. Thanks. I have a question of Dr. Mountain. Uh, I was interested in Roy, and it seems to me that what you found with Roy is you, know, I mean, you weren't able to identify, had you just the DNA data, a, a, a village or a nation or an ethnicity, you essentially got sort of a uh, race admixture for him. But what interests but what I'm, I'm really asking is, do you have more ROYs? Because at this point, it's anecdotal. Do you have a sample of 30 ROYs so we can see when it works and doesn't? So there, are, I think uh, what we're hearing here is a couple of questions about how to be, have more confidence in the results so that customers can have more confidence in the results. And so one way is to have 30 ROYs who know their you know, history, and, and then we see if we recover that through DNA. And um, but what we the other way is to simulate uh, individuals, simulate ROYs, or simulate and 
so that we, we do sometimes do something like that. Um, we also have this approach where we look, look at the precision and recall where we ask, um, which is a little bit different, um, but we just ask how often if you do have a segment that does, should, should be identified as coming from one region, how often does it actually, the DNA show that? And, and we rerun our, our, we keep tweaking our algorithms until that's really high. And then we actually allow the customers to choose how their level, the level of accuracy that they want to look at. And so that's another thing we do in that direction. But um, finding lots of people who know, have, who can be gold standards, who really know the truth, so to speak, and then we can see if we can recover that. That's a challenge, and it's something we've been discussing earlier this week. Um, if there would be someone who would send to each of the companies these kind of gold standard people and samples and say, can you tell, tell us what your best estimate, and we'll see if, you know, which companies get it close to what we yeah, expect. Yeah, so send us your samples. Everybody has good genealogies, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and we'll have to stop here. I want to thank the, uh, the panelists. It was very thank informative. You, Mark. Thank you.